Greetings and welcome back to room 303 AP English, the Roberts Lectures. We are in the Poetics section. We turn now to Judith Ortiz Kofer's Latin Women Pray, uh, her 1987 offering. Now, of course, Otis Kofer is a very important poet and writer for us in 303. Born in 1952, died in uh, 2016. She is a Puerto Rican American author. She's written so much stuff, of course, poetry, fiction, prose, autobiography. Already at LearnStrong.net, we have uh, treated her Latin Deli, Aris Poetica, as well as one of the important stories of 303 American history. Let's now turn to Latin Women Pray. And in 2B, I want you to write down right away the tone here, okay? I want you to pay attention to the tone. And there's so much that Kofer brings to her work and Ortiz Kofer brings to her work. And one of them always is this subtle tone that's such an important part of everything we read. Let's just enjoy this one. Latin women pray in incense-sweet churches. They pray in Spanish to an Anglo god with a Jewish heritage. And this great white father, imperturbable in his marble pedestal, looks down upon his brown daughters, votive candles shining like lust in his all-seeing eyes, unmoved by their persistent prayers. Yet, year after year, before his image they kneel, Margarita, Josefina, Maria, and Isabel, all fervently hoping that if not omnipotent, at least he be bilingual. Now one of the things right away that we should point out, just looking at this poem, is notice the absence of any punctuation marks. Notice that at the end of the poem, the word bilingual, there is no period. Now, again, we can ask it to be, why would a poet do this? Using punctuation, not using punctuation in 3A, we immediately think of E.E. E. Cummings and the way that he decides to often not use punctuation. I think one of the reasons for not using punctuation is that in a poem like this, we're only showing something. I don't think that uh, or, or, um, Ortiz Kofer wants to tell us as much as she wants to show us something. Well, what is she showing us? That we have Latin women, right, who are in fact praying, fervently praying, and the obvious question is, praying to whom or to what? And for what purpose? And in fact, is it meaningful? Is it valuable? And obviously the ironic tone is going to help us to read this poem. Notice we began, first of all, by pointing out that the incense sweet churches, what we have sometimes in 303 called, when we're speaking of any kind of religious practice, the smells and bells of a religion. That is to say, the stuff that's uh, formal, that is, uh, observable, right? Notice the irony. They play in, pray in, a span, in Spanish, we'll come back to this idea of being bilingual at the end, right? To an Anglo god with a Jewish heritage. In other words, this is not the original religion of the Latin women who are praying, right? Notice about God, looks down upon his brown daughters, votive candles, and then an interesting uh, simile, shining like lust in his all-seeing eyes, unmoved by their persistent prayers. And the moment we see this unmoved, we think of uh, Richard Ebert's The Fury of Aerial Bombardment that we've studied already in Roberts on page 688, and we've given a lecture for already as well at LearnStrong.net. The first part of the poem, then the first ten lines, will set up the second part of the poem with the word yet, and then the phrase year after year, before his image they kneel, and then you have the names of any number of possible pray, um, prayers, right? All fervently hoping, and then the irony, if he's not omnipotent, at least he's bilingual. In other words, the hope that maybe God will at least understand and appreciate my situation, or our situation, or the Latin women praying's situation. Well, what are we going to say at 2A about these messages? Well, let's go ahead and put it on our notes. This is clearly a theodicy. We know this term. We've used it regularly in 303. That is to say, the question of why is it that an all-powerful, all-loving deity allows for terrible things to happen? Immediately we think of our conversations regarding Milton's Paradise Lost. Obviously, the book of Job comes to mind as well. 
And the 2A message here seems to be that our speaker in this poem suggests that maybe there's not a whole lot of re connection with reality between the pain and suffering of the Latin women who are praying and their praying lives to a deity. Of course, at 2B, the ironic tone is the one, as well as that beautiful simile about uh, votive candles shining like lust. It is that fine line between the religious and the profane, and, and Ortiz Cofer is brilliant at doing this kind of thing. At 3A, we've mentioned already a number of titles. Um, uh, I'd like to as well throw at you a couple of others that we've studied here in 303 that resurrect this question of skepticism or doubt. Um, Hardy's Are You Digging on My Grave, as well as Matthew Arnold's classic Dover Beach. The sea of faith was once two at the full, and round earth surely like the folds of a bright girdle furl, but now I only hear so long withdrawing melancholy roar. That idea that faith and belief can work for a while, but then slowly it starts to lose its power seems to be a, 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 an idea here present in this poem. Finally, in 3B, how can you relate this to yourself? When, when was the last time that you were in, in pain and driven to prayer? Did it, did it help? Or did it not help? How about this one as a question in regards to this poem? Which do you think is harder? People of faith and belief who pray, or people who do not have uh, belief and do not pray in terms of dealing with pain? Well, of course, uh, Ortez Kofer, we always say after we've read one, we want to read more of her amazing work. Thank you.